Okay, here we go. Um, chapter 12, Respiratory Disorders. Disclosure statement. I don't own this material. It's only recordings from my lectures for my nursing students' use. And these recorders don't give or intend to give medical advice. So what are we going to cover during respiratory? Respiratory is probably the greatest chance of being on the test or being on the NCLEX because ABC, airway, breathing, circulation, these are the kids that need to be pulled to the back fastest. Okay. So whenever you think airway problem, kids especially, there's a lot of difference in their pediatric respiratory system than adults. So that makes them more important than some other kids waiting in the waiting room, but also adults as well. So we're going to do a little bit about respiratory. Okay, so you got to know your anatomy and physiology, right? You need to know what's in the upper airway, what's in the lower airway. You have to know about the lungs. You need to know about the rib cage and the thoracic cavity. You got to know these things. You got to know your anatomy and physiology and how that works. So make sure you look at the picture in the book on 214, 218. Sorry, I can't see. I don't have my glasses on. Um, so the nasal cavity, most of the time, what you're thinking about is the nasal cavity is coming in, warming up air moisturizing it before it hits the lungs so if they're mouth breathing they're not getting that benefit um the nasal cavity also catches a lot of bugs that are in the air so saves us from a lot of colds and flus and stuff like that um the oral cavity the epiglottitis will be important on the test epiglottis if that is inflamed it's epiglottitis that is a medical emergency that needs to be pulled to the back first. And we know that because that sounds like drooling. A kid that's drooling cannot um, clear his airway and he's going to code first. Um, vocal cord dysfunction. So some kids are allergic to uh, noxious stimuli, things like swimming pool, chlorine. If they were in a swimming pool area or go down the chemical aisle, those can slam shut. So there's a lot of um, speech language pathology in this area. Um, pharynx, larynx, esophageal, um, esophageal varices, esophageal issues with being in a smoking household. Esophagus, for the most part, remember terrible too. You have to cut up their food because things get stuck, right? So foreign body obstruction. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, lungs, so know about pneumothorax, know about hemothorax. Most of the time it's going to be a tension pneumothorax because we've bagged the baby too much with too much air, with too much pressure and we end up popping a lung. So this is common in the NICU. Okay, so there are some developmental differences when it comes to the respiratory system for kids that you need to keep in mind. Those are in the book, um, the developmental differences, just to highlight some of those um, obligatory nose breather until four weeks of age. Um, the sinuses, they're not fully aerated until four months old, so they're not going to have a sinus infection in the beginning of life. The larynx is flexible, more flexible than an adult, and easily stimulated to spasm, so laryngospasm. The larynx can spaz and end up being closed, <laughs> um, especially important like RSV and things like that. The intercostal muscles are not fully developed, so you'll see abdominal wall movement with respirations. That's normal until about six years old. So you're going to see their respirations 
that gives you a clue if you see retractions, grunting, flaring, that's a kid that's in respiratory distress. Um, periods of apnea, so holding their breath, especially in the NICU, this is common. So we usually keep the kids in the NICU until they have no apnea, no bradycardia spells until seven days after. Once they have no A and Bs and nothing else to keep them, then we'll go ahead and send them home. But what we don't want is for that to happen at home, nobody to be awake and help that child. They will be ending up with a SIDS um, designation because they will die in their sleep. So can last up to 15 seconds. That's normal in the newborn period. We go over, tell them, wake up, breathe, <laughs> and they're going to be fine. But if not, we have to start CPR. Um, higher oxygen demand. So a newborn uses four to eight liters of oxygen a minute, where an adult uses three to four. Child's respiratory rate is faster, and it's a more irregular pattern. Um, they don't have the defense of bronchospasms to trap foreign irritants. Um, because smooth muscle is not fully developed until five months of age. You can see the alveoli, um, 25 million alveoli until age three. Um, and then the lungs become more complex and reach 300 million by adulthood. Um, the bifurcation of the right and left bronchi occurs higher in the airway than the right bronchus enters the lung at a steeper angle. Um, the cartilage surrounding the trachea is flexible, and this can compress the airway if the head is not positioned properly. So what we talk about with kids is the sniffing position. You have to have them in the sniffing position. So if a test question sounded like a doctor came in and asked why you had a washcloth rolled up behind their shoulder blades, that's to keep them in the sniffing position. It keeps the head slightly more um, hyperextended. Okay, so the problem with kids is if you hyperextend it, it closes the airway. And if you underextend it, it's going to close the airway. <coughs> so they need to be in a sniffing position. The lung volume is proportional to the chest size. Um, lung growth continues through adolescence. Their tonsils and lymphoid um, tissues are larger than an adult's, so it can easily close the throat. AP diameter is equal at birth, but then decreases with age. So their um, AP diameter. Okay. So let's move along. So when you do anything with a kid that has a respiratory disorder, you want to look at your ADPI, right? So just keep thinking ADPI with each one of these. What's the assessment? What would I see? What general history is the mom telling me, right? So they're going to say, oh, yeah, the babysitter's kid had RSV. Oh, well, <laughs> there you go right so you want a general history what's going on in the house is there a new pet is there a new what 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 is it is somebody smoking is somebody what what's new in the environment why this kid is ending up here so you do a general history and that is includes the ob history as well so if this is a newborn you really dig in to the ob history because the ob history can tell you a lot with the respiratory system especially if there was GBS sepsis. So then um, a little bit of the OB history, if it's a newborn, the physical assessment, you're looking at the baby. Are they working to breathe? Is it grunting, flaring, retractions? If it's grunting, flaring, retractions, this kid is in distress. We need to pull him to the back. If he's got junk in his lungs, it sounds like aspiration, right? And then you actually auscultate the lungs and hear them and see what's going on. So you will see that in your book, the differences. Um, palpation also occurs with these kids. So in pneumonia, if you put your hands on their chest, 
go back and look it up in physical assessment. But if you put your hands on their chest, on their back, you will feel your hands in and out, in and out, but also tactile from it is. So if it's pneumonia, you're going to feel it in your hands when you tell them to say the words 99 or blue moon, okay? So that's how you tell the difference between pneumonia and other lung diseases. Pneumonia is going to verberate, vibrate on your hands when they're saying the words. Other things will not. That's how you know there's a consolidation of fluid in the bottom of their lungs. So percussion, timpani. Timpani is air. Dull. Dull means fluid right hyper resonance asthma okay so percussion is going to tell you a lot about what's in the lungs before you do a chest x-ray palpation there's your tactile from it is and then diagnostic tests there's a ton of diagnostic tests right look in the book tons of diagnostic tests the ones that i would remember is peak flow meter know how to use a peak flow meter know what pulmonary function tests are and then also the sweat test. The sweat test is used for cystic fibrosis. You can't touch the, the filter paper that is used to collect the sweat. The sweat is being analyzed for how much chloride is in it. Kids that have CF taste salty. The mom will say their skin tastes salty. That's a key indicator of cystic fibrosis. All right. So when we get started with upper airway, right? Upper airway, we think nose, throat, ear, nose, throat, doctor, okay? So in the ears, we're talking about otitis media. Otitis media is ear infection. Ear infection that got too much, the um, tympanic membrane will actually bulge towards you when you're looking in their ear, okay? That's an effusion. So there's fluid behind the eardrum, and that's causing pain, also hearing loss, irritability, things like that. So what's the normal sign for otitis media pulling down on the ear? Because the baby can't tell you. A child will tell you, my ear hurts, but an infant will pull or tug on their ear or be loving to you because they like the heat on their ear, okay? Know about tinnitus. Tinnitus is a ringing in your ears. It can drive you nuts, right? It just drives you nuts because that's all you hear. And things like stress and caffeine can make it worse. Okay. Otitis externa. Otitis externa is outer ear. Media and middle ear. Externa. Swimmer's ear. Swimmer's ear is because you didn't shake out your ear after you swam. So if you go to a float tank place, they ask you to wear ear protection to keep the salt water out of your ears. If you don't, then they offer vinegar water. So they mix half and half vinegar and water because vinegar is going to evaporate quickly and take the water with it. So you can use a vinegar solution after you um, get out of the pool. Either way, it's an inflamed tissue, so you're probably going to have an antibiotic for a couple of days, and it's a drop, an eardrop, right? So when we talk about eardrops with kids, we're talking up over three, down under three. So two to three, they say go down, over three, go up. Why? Look at your ear canal. Your, over time, your ear sags. Your canal does too. So you need to pull it up to put it in alignment. Kids, it's already past the alignment. You're pulling down to make it align. Okay. Um, if you have otitis externa, when you touch the tragus, that's going to be painful. That's externa. Okay. The pain that you feel with otitis media is going to be inside the ear down the throat down the lymph node when you touch them here it's going to hurt okay all right sinusitis sinusitis sinus infection right 
So inflammation of the sinuses. So if you've never had a sinus infection, they're going to tap here and ask you, does it feel full? You're also hearing dull or tympany. Tympany is air. Dull is fluid. So you can get inflamed sinuses. They may have to do a rotor rooter job eventually to get into your sinuses to allow them to drain. Know about the neti pot. That is an obvious thing that people do because they go to the pharmacy and find this thing, right? What do you want to do with sinusitis? Well, what's it called? Um, oh, the mucus guy on TV, the commercial. Mucinex, right? You want to do mucinex. That gets the mucus broke up. Think about this. Anytime you have a bunch of mucus, you want them to drink lots of fluid. Drinking fluid thins the mucus, letting it come out easier. What happens when you have a sinus infection or, or pharyngitis, things like that? You don't want to drink because it hurts your throat. Okay. Nasopharyngitis is nasopharynx inflammation. Think about pharyngitis. Pharyngitis is usually losing your voice, right? So inflamed tissues in that area, sore throat, the whole deal. Um, the other thing you need to remember when you're doing this chapter is that it's going to be highly ABG related. So you need to remember your ABGs. So nasal pharyngitis um, could be adenovirus, RSV, influenza, flu, para-influenza. Um, so it's in the cold months and it lasts four to ten days. Nasal congestion, bacterial infection with a sore throat. Nasal swab, throat swabs, know about them, know how to do them. With COVID, I think everybody knows about it. But make sure you know you need to get back there to get a good sample. Pharyngitis, the pharynx being inflamed, again, loss of um, voice, viral causes, adenovirus, group A strep. Just keep group A strep and adenovirus in the back of your mind, right? So what happens when you have a strep throat that goes too long without being seen? It ends up hurting the heart. That strep A can go to the heart and cause valve problems, rheumatic heart disease, okay? So that's always the thing. You want to get them in to see the doctor and on antibiotics if it truly is strep throat. We'll do a swab, throat swab, a nose swab, and that's how you know if it's strep A, strep B, strep C, what, whatever it is. Suctioning when you have a baby, it's very important to remember mouth, then nose. So you put it in alphabetical order. So when you're bulb syringing, you depress the bulb syringe, put it in the mouth, suck out what you got. Most of the time it's vomit. It's old milk. And you're going to the side of their mouth, not down the middle. If you go down the middle, you're going to hit the gag reflex. Also, you do the mouth first because if there is stuff in there, they're going to aspirate it when you go into the nose. The nose is noxious. The nose is noxious. So when you go up their nose, they're going to pull away and they don't want you there. Okay. Okay. Influenza, I think we all know about the flu. This is going to be whatever strain is coming around. Know about um, vaccinations. So vaccinations, it, we don't longer have it on the market, but the nose spray was the one that was not a live vaccine. It is a live vaccine, right? So the flu shot is not the live vaccine. So that's why they took it off the market because it's a live vaccine. A lot of people were giving it to immunocompromised individuals. It also wasn't that effective. So we'd rather have the um, flu shot once a year for anybody six months and older. So at six months, you can give the flu shot. Two, eight years, we usually suggest that age. 
But again, if you have asthma, a history of like cystic fibrosis, something immunocompromised, you want to keep doing that every year. Um, bacterial infections secondary are common with your influenza. So influenza, what's it feel like? Um, abrupt onset, fever, chills, headache, flushed cheeks, cough, malaise, cold symptoms. Um, can be A or B. We'd usually do a rapid strep and rapid flu at the same time. And then just supportive care of symptoms, antipyretics. It's self-limiting. Let the virus do its thing, right? Tonsillitis. So again, remember uh, in your book on 227, you want to know the grades of um tonsil swelling so one plus two plus three plus four plus so four plus is the worst where the tonsils are actually touching and kissing each other that means that the baby or the child could actually um close their airway so one plus nor two plus normal three plus is enlarged with infection so if you say ah there are huge sacs that pop out of the top of the throat. And there's um, questions, or there's pictures in their book. So just understand that. Eventually, if it gets too bad, we're going to go ahead and take those tonsils out. What do the questions sound like around tonsillitis? No red popsicles, no red whatever, because you don't know if it's blood or not. What is tonsillitis, tonsil? removal sound like on the test bleeding after surgery bleeding after surgery is the biggest risk so you'd want them swallowing but you observe constant swallowing constant swallowing repeated swallowing means they're swallowing blood okay so bleeding is the biggest risk as after tonsillectomy anybody have tonsillectomy yeah so it's usually strep throat if you don't have tonsils anymore it's probably strep throat um, because the tonsils are the tonsils and adenoids are usually taken out it's a TNA so the adenoids are also up in here they cause some nosebleeds after okay so TNA after tonsil and adenoidectomy sometimes they end up with a lot of nosebleeds and that's a normal expected finding tonsils nosebleeds know about it know how to deal with it right nosebleed you know, pinching the nose and leaning forward you don't want to swallow all that blood when you're swallowing blood it could aspirate or it could choke you it could close the airway it's an airway issue every time okay tracheitis uh tracheitis is the trachea being inflamed again Staph aureus, S pneumonia, or group A strep, uh, artificial airways, intubation. So remember your whole ventilator precautions, right? It's the same stuff. It's that strider at risk. This happens after a baby has been intubated or a child has been intubated. Um, so it's an ICU, an ICU, PICU issue. Painful anxiety producing um, intubation for respiratory failure, endoscopy removal of membranes if it's obstructing the airway. Okay. So moving on, what are rails? Okay, you got to know your sounds, right? You got to know your sounds. What are rails? <laughs> You gotta know wheezes, you gotta know strider, you gotta know ronchi, you gotta know rails. What are rails? Fine crackle noises. Okay. All right, so then we get into the non infectious upper airway issues. So I don't see a good picture of this in the book, but I want you to look up this esophageal atresia and this tra tracheoesophageal fistula. I call it transesophageal fistula because when you think about it, it's going between the 
trachea and the esophagus. A fistula means there's a hole, an abnormal opening. So think about what the baby would present like. It's going to be a baby, right? Because you're going to find it right away during birth. Okay. Birth to three days, seven days, you're going to see this. So esophageal atresia means there is no connection for the esophagus going south. So there may be a pocket of the upper esophagus, but it doesn't actually connect to the stomach. So what's that going to sound like? Failure to thrive, vomiting, everything's coming right back up when they try to feed this baby. Don't think, oh, new mom, go in and actually try to feed the baby yourself. So esophageal atresia is like a pocket and everything you put in the pocket comes right back up, especially when you lay them down. So you wouldn't want to lay them on their back because they'll aspirate on it. So you typically have these guys a little bit on their side or their head of their bed up for that reason. Sometimes we put rice cereal flakes in their food to thicken it for GERD. That doesn't even help because that's not the problem. Okay. Tracheoesophageal fistula means there's a hole that's going between or a new opening right into the trachea. This is a problem when you're feeding them because they're going to choke and aspirate on the formula down their lungs. Okay, so this is something we need to know about right away. Laryngomalacia, tracheomalacia. These are things that are floppy, right? So the larynx is floppy or the trachea is floppy. One way or another, we don't have a good airway. That's why we want to keep the kid in the sniffing position. Larynx omalacia is the larynx. You can see that in your book. So that's congenital. And tracheomalacia is congenital or acquired. So that's inspiratory strider, crowing noise with respirations, substernal retraction, strider, and associated with esophageal reflux. So history and clinical symptoms that increase with feedings and the gold standard is a flexible or rigid laryngoscopy. So you need to know about laryngoscopy. That's a big um, key procedure to know. So think about this. After bronchoscopy, they come back to the unit. You need to be one-on-one -on -one with that baby in the, in the PICU. You cannot have mom be by the bedside. They're going to be on their cell phone. They're not going to be watching this baby for you. Okay? So they're under conscious sedation or sedation, and you need to be there to bring them back out because you're basically the PACU. Okay? Um, signs and symptoms of baseline versus worsening conditions, monitor feeds for difficult sucking or swallowing or choking, uh, ensure adequate intake, and reassure patients that most children outgrow this by age two. Subglottic stenosis. Stenosis means narrowing. So the glottic area is thin and closed. So that is a narrowing of the airway with the rigid cricoid cartilage that's congenital and results from a long time intubation. So you're going to see this in trach care, in trach kids, in kids that have been in the NICU or the PICU. Okay. So this is why a lot of those kids are on home health care. Croup. You need to know all about croup. Croup is a mist tent, okay? Warm, humidified air in a mist tent. At home, it's going to be cool, humidified air because we don't want anybody being burnt. In the hospital, we use a mist tent. What, what does mom have at home that's a mist tent? The shower. So you tell the kid, the mom to get in the shower with the kid and turn on the warm water and let it run, right? So while in a shower, that's the perfect time for those croup symptoms to disappear because they're getting warm, humidified air. So croup 
is kind of, you know, self-limiting. Um, it is going to be inflammatory process, barky cough, strider, respiratory distress, and hoarseness. It could be viral or bacterial. And it's one of the most um, common ones coming into the ER. You want to rest the voice. They're going to have laryngitis, loss of voice, hoarseness, pain when speaking, difficulty coughing. This is the seal-like bark. Okay. So you can see a picture of all the viral croup syndromes, including epiglottitis being the worst. Um spasmodic laryngitis, right? It's going to be that seal-like barky cough, a free braille, mild respiratory distress. This is why we tell people um, to make sure they stay home during the winter and not have a bunch of visitors because this can occur and the kid gets sick very easily, especially in the beginning ages where the larynx and the um, trachea are so flexible. Epiglottitis is on the other end of that spectrum <laughs> because it's the worst case scenario. If you have a kid, it's going to sound like drooling in the ER. Tripod positioning. So they're going to want to be leaning forward over their knees with their elbows on their knees, <laughs> leaning forward or over the bedside table. They're going to want to be up. And they're an emergency because if you use your tongue blade, you are going to slam their little airway shut. So what do you think you need to do? One, identify it and get it to the back immediately. This is the most serious one. Two to eight years old and it's an abrupt onset, progresses until the point of complete obstruction. Sudden high fever, drooling, dyspnea, dysphagia, strider, can't eat, can't breathe. This kid needs to go to the back and we need to have an emergency airway ready. The only time we're going to touch him is when we're intubating him. It's that bad. Okay. RSV, big time. You need to know it because there is a vaccine for it. Okay. You're going to need to know RSV. RSV is one of those things that you just got to know. Um, bronchiitis, bronchioitis, again, lower airway disorders. The bronchial, the bronch is in the lungs. It's the big trunk of the tree. Okay. This is um, chronic inflammation or uh, acute inflammation, wheezing caused by rhinovirus. RSV, and that's an acute inflammation. Typically, um, kids less than 24 months, and most of the time it's caused by a virus or a bacteria, RSV, rhinovirus, mucal cells, creating debris, mucus production, bronchospasm and obstruction. So think about this. Anytime you have mucus, drink, 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 drink to be able to water it down. Again, with pneumonia, that's a consolidation in the bottom of the lungs. You can hear it. You can he feel it with tactile fremitus, right? This needs to be treated. If it's a community and acquired pneumonia, it needs to be reported. Pneumonia kind of makes its rounds every winter, um, caused by viruses, bacteria, mycoplasmum, fungus, and aspiration. So a lot of the times we'll have aspiration pneumonia for a reason, right after the baby cannot eat and having aspiration. <laughs> whooping cough. This is the reason why we tell grandparents and parents, please go get the whooping cough vaccine before the baby comes home from the NICU. Also, nurses take whooping cough vaccine in the NICU and PICU because we are most at risk of giving it to kids as well that are already sick with something else. Whooping cough pertussis is in that DTAP shot. Again, they would have gotten that at 246, so the kids that are going to get sick are usually not fully vaccinated.
highly contagious spring and summer months. Your DTAP shot should be given. So this is coughing attacks that occur at night. Thick mucus antitussive emesis. So they cough so much they throw up. Coughing spells might last four to eight weeks. And this is also known as the 100-day cough because it just doesn't go away. Okay. TB. Know about TB. Know about how many millimeters the center of the MAN2 test should be. Make sure that you understand that the MAN2 test, the skin test, is not definitive. It's a screener, so you would continue screening with a chest x-ray or quantiferon. Make sure you know the difference between latent tuberculosis and active. Some people are allergic to the MAN2 shot and react regardless whether they have it or not. So you cannot tell they have TB from the shot that we do for the screener. We'll do that in lab. Coronavirus. Um, coronavirus, obviously, um, most people know that from COVID-19. There is a nice um, chart in your book about COVID versus influenza versus the common cold. Okay. So respiratory distress syndrome. This comes into play in the NICU, in the newborn nursery, and this is a acute issue in the newborn. So think about respiratory distress, meconium aspiration, things like that. So we have a kid that's not breathing very well. Well, is he also temperature unstable? Because if he has a low temperature, now I'm worried about GBS. So that GBS bacteria that lives between the anus and the vagina that gets treated before delivery of the baby, this can cause us to have um, GBS sepsis. If that is not treated before the baby goes home, there's a good chance the baby's going to become septic at home. If there's no pediatric visit in the first three to seven days, that's when the baby is going to go full-blown GBS. So think about vulnerable populations that are not going to follow up. Respiratory distress sounds like the first 24 hours of life, the kid just can't get a breath. He's having trouble. He's working, breathing. He's nose flaring, grunting, and retracting. He probably needs to go to the NICU, be observed a little closer, and given a little blow by, potentially put on a BiPAP or a CPAP. Respiratory distress is kind of set into RDS and TTN. TTN is to transient tachypnea of the newborn, and it's just a period of time where the baby is very high respiratory rate, but it will resolve on its own. Respiratory distress looks like cracked glass, shattered glass on the chest x-ray. So we're going to leave him in the NICU. He's going to be in there for about seven days and get antibiotic therapy. Most commonly, meconium aspiration or GBS sepsis baby that did not get treated or did get treated but did not get enough. We'll go ahead and give him the gentamicin and stuff for seven days before he goes home. Acute respiratory distress is something like <sighs> choking, right? Respiratory distress, acute respiratory distress. Think about... <laughs> your older kids. So drowning, smoke inhalation, viral infection, that's pulmonary edema, things like that. So if a kid was in a house fire, it's going to be acute respiratory distress syndrome. <laughs> what are we doing when he gets in the ER? We're flooding him with oxygen because carbon monoxide is full in his lungs. He'll look perfectly fine on the ADG and the um, O2 sat, but we know that his lungs are full of carbon monoxide. We need to flood that with an extra oxygen to get it out of the lungs. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia. I want you to go look up this for the All Children's Hospital in St. Pete's. St. Pete and Boston Children's is the two U.S. hospitals 
worldwide as well that can do that surgery and St. John Hopkins has um, 90% success rate on that. So that's when the baby has nothing in his belly and it's obvious because his belly's flat. He's breathing, but his breathing is up in his chest that is very stridorous. He's having trouble breathing and work of breathing is terrible. You're also hearing the bowel sounds, the breath sounds, everything in his chest. Why would we have bowel sounds in the chest? Because all those organs go through the diaphragmatic hole and start developing in his chest, which means the lungs are pushed out of the way, the heart's pushed out of the way. So we have to do a two-step, three-step, four-step surgery. So we pull down the abdominal organs, let them rest, close the hole in the diaphragm, and then reinflate the lungs with ec ECMO. Using ECMO, we can then take a couple days, see how his lungs are doing. Those lungs are not fully developed, so he stays in, the, in John Hopkins. This is an insurance paid patient, and the only other option that the mom is given is abortion at that point. Um, they are told if it's past a certain time that they're going to have to um, have this baby, but the baby's not going to live very long. The lungs are not working. The heart may be under their underarm. It's a very severe disease, um, congenital and abnormality that can be treated easily if you have insurance and if you get to one of the two centers. So kids are flown in from all over the world and they have a lot of success at John Hopkins. So that's a whole other specialty up on the eighth floor of John Hopkins Hospital. Cystic fibrosis, you need to know right, left, back, front, up and down. Some of the things they'll hit you with with cystic fibrosis is going to be sweat, right? So they need more salt in their diet, especially if they're in a warm environment. They need to drink. They have thick liquid, uh, thick, thick secretions, thick mucus. So they're going to be in a CPT, so chest physiotherapy either cupping the baby or on a machine. Cystic fibrosis sounds like um, pancreatic enzymes, okay? So when they eat, you have to give them pancreatic enzymes because they have exocrine issues as well as no, um, no ability to digest nutrients such as fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So they're going to be on a high carbohydrate uh, high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet. Amylase, trypsin, and lipase are missing, and the hepatic bile ducts, gallbladder glands are obstructed by thick mucus, so they end up with their um, pancreatic enzymes for sure. So this kid is going to be a lifelong child coming to the unit to do cystic fibrosis um, how do they call it? Uh, it's an extended stay and they're uh, tune-up. So they are a cystic fibrosis tune-up. So they get a variety of antibiotics, steroids um, to tune them up once or twice a year. <laughs> so think about how I would get thick mucus from my lower airway to my upper airway to get it to throw out. They need to be on their side, on your, on your knees, with their head down, and you cup them to get that um, thick mucus out of those membranes. Um, what else? Cystic fibrosis is going to be all over the test. I can just tell you that now. And then asthma, getting older, um, you're going to have your asthma. Again, it could be exercise. It could be stress-induced. It could be cold air, smoke, viral, pet dander, cockroaches. could be almost anything. So we usually are talking about acute or chronic, right? Chronic asthma, eventually they're going to be on um, steroids, things like that in exercise asthma is going to be on a bronchodilator. Know the difference between bronchodilator, mucolytic, and steroids. Know how to give them. Know when to rinse the mouth. You know this.
you know this. Um, the differences in asthma with a kid is they're um, respiratory driven. So they're going to go down, they're going to go down fast. And it usually involves not having their rescue inhaler with them. Foreign body aspiration, that's going to be a toddler too, and you didn't cut up the popcorn, the hot dog, the bagel, the marshmallow, right? Foreign body aspiration, know how to do, go back to BLS and know how to do the Heimlich. Also know what to do when the baby goes limp in your arms and is still choking. So chest compressions, back blows, chest compressions, back blows. Okay, know how to do that. Think about use gravity with you so their butt's up in the air and their chest is supported on your upper arm, on your leg. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Again, know about it. Um, it could be on the test. Know about a spacer for asthma. Know about peak flow meter. Peak flow meter is different from incentive spirometer. Um, bronchodysplasia, respiratory disorder of premature infants, so respiratory and neurodevelopment problems. These bronchopulmonary dysplasia are the kids with oxygen running around in school, so they tend to get picked on. Ensure, all you have to remember is ensure, so intubation, surfactant, and um, extubation as quickly as possible. We want to get kids extubated quickly. Remember, too much oxygen is a thing. Too much oxygen in the NICU or the PICU. Um, think about the area between the eyes and the nose. Ours is long, theirs is short. So the oxygen leaks under the mask and burns their eyes. They end up with cataracts and need LASIK surgery before they go home from the NICU. So we go very, very quickly down on our oxygen to what they need versus just flood them. In kids, we are not flooding anybody. In kids, we in the NICU, we give like a quarter of a liter. We're not giving 10 liters. That's not even, you're not doing that. 10 liters will cause you to have a blind kid. Apnea is, like I said, um, holding their breath. So apnea, Brady's, seven days. Apparent life-threatening events, also known as breweries. Um, brief, resolved, unexplained event can happen. You know SIDS is going to be on the test. Know about the SIDS. If you look up um, crib safety, um, back to sleep, all of that, all of that's going to be on the test. So any unexplained infant death um, lumped under the SIDS. Pneumothorax, again, because we're blowing the lungs with so much air, we may actually end up pneumothoraxing them, which is air in the lung, right? Look, look at what that would be. Displaced trachea, no air getting in one lung will needle their chest. So we use a little IV catheter and needle their chest, put in a, um, como se dice, um, a Heimlich valve. So look up Heimlich valve because we use a lot more Heimlich valves than chest tubes. We do use chest tubes, so you need to know how to set up a chest tube as well. Smoking and vaping, again, a lot we don't know. Vaping is not safer. A lot we don't know, popcorn, lung, the whole deal. So anytime you have smoking, you're going to have increased risk of preterm labor, um, placental issues in utero, right? Um, asthma, ear infections, the whole deal. What do we tell mom and dad about smoking when we're sending home a baby? If you're going to smoke, smoke outside. If you're going to smoke, smoke in a jacket that you can take off and not bring it back into the house around the baby because of secondhand smoke. Okay. Subglottic stenosis. Stenosis. Remember what stenosis was? Stenosis. Okay. Soft, floppy. Nope. Stenosis. Stenosis. What was stenosis? 
narrowing, narrowing of the airway, right? So stenosis is the narrowing of the airway of the rigid car cricoid cartilage. Most of the time when you're intubating, they will need cricoid cartilage pressure, and that's expected for you to do. You just have to be ready when they're doing a trach. Either the respiratory therapist or the NICU doctor will ask you to do cricoid pressure, and it's very, very little pressure versus an adult. All right. So in this chapter, we covered anatomy and physiology, different respiratory disorders in the upper airway, the lower airway, the infectious and the non-infectious, and other non-infectious disorders. Thank you.